now. Just uh, start. I'd like to welcome all of you to the Wikimedia and the College of Complexes Playground for People to Think. We have a small crowd here. Guys, we can't hear you. Louder, David. We have a small crowd here at the restaurant today. I'm not going to go through all the long list of tools and everything else. No, still, I think it's technical. We can't hear you. Yeah. It's loud. You're going to turn on the microphone, maybe? It is. Yeah. I'm going to go through the whole usual list of rules tonight. So one tool at a time and no personal attacks. All right. Tonight we have a, a group of speakers and an open microphone. And um, our, our preferred feature is this. First of all, Charlie's going to lead off with the announcements of an upcoming program. Okay. All right, Charlie. All right. Uh, go ahead, Charlie. Uh, Ernie's here, so uh, go through. Uh, um. All right. Welcome to meeting number three thousand seven hundred and forty-nine of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Think. Now, but I'll go quickly through these tonight. Uh, now, although I am not a capitalist, I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. We've got nine of them scheduled. On January the 20th, our own Jonathan Barton will be talking about the need to preserve progressive legislation. On January the 27th, activists from Chicago, Kathy Powers, will be talking about accessibility for the disabled and the handicapped regulations regarding that provision for it. On February the 3rd, Ken, uh, Ken Williams has a very detailed PowerPoint presentation covering the accomplishments of the Biden administration and why we should elect Joe. On February the 10th, our own Jim Fitzer, who's here tonight, will be talking about why nobody update on the Sandy Hook situation. On February the 17th, uh, our oldest, one of our oldest participating members, Sid Cohen, will be talking about society and capitalism. That one could go on all night. On February the 24th, Professor Lichtenberg of philosophy will be talking about morality and moral principles, which we all need, you guys in particular. On March the 2nd, Dr. Mike Grouse of the Center for Pluralism will be talking about the situation in Israel and the Gaza with the uh, Muslim people. Uh, we have four dates open in March if we would like to speak. On April the 6th, we'll be commencing our uh, Earth Day series of speakers with Andy Anderson, who's going to list, give us a list of things everyone should do. Everyone should do <laughs> to save the planet and what they're doing in other countries. They got two dates open uh, to fill out Earth Month. On April the 27th, um, Enrique Perez will be talking about no matter who is running for office for president in November. He says it's incumbent upon everyone to vote Republican. Okay, <laughs> Tim, uh, take it away. Whatever order we, we want to go is fine with me. You might want to check that microphone, though. It doesn't seem like it's working too well. Thank you. How many speakers are there? All right. Here? Can everybody hear me okay out there now? I'm afraid so. You can't. Okay. It was just a low voice from David then. It's all right. Okay. I'm going to 
I'll just uh, leave it up to anybody else who wants to go first. Um, we'll get you that later on, Mike. Are there four? There's four people, right? Okay, who wants to go first? We are on tour. Yes. I go last. Yeah, uh, you go last, uh, Ernie. What's that? Yeah, Ernie, that's fine. We'll get you, uh, Mike. Jim, you want to go first, or? Uh, Sir, I'm um, fine. I'm fine. I'll go, I'll go third. That means I'm second and go third. All right, let's go, Jim. Okay. Jay. Uh, all right, let me uh, let me get everything here set up real quick so we can do it. Um, just give me a second here to get the screen taken care of. Bear with me for a minute, please. Okay, Jim, when you're ready, do you, can you share a screen? Are you going to be using a presentation? Yeah, I'll be good. I'm ready to go. All right. Go ahead, Jim. Well, in the past, the American government has sold some whoppers to the American people. For example, that Lee Oswald was a lone assassin of JFK, that we went to the moon repeatedly beginning in 1969, that 19 Islamic terrorists under the control of a guy named Osama bin Laden attacked us on 9-11, or that Joe Biden was elected president of the United States with an overwhelming vote in 2020. Now, each of those was sufficiently complicated. It required certain kinds of knowledge about, say, the laws of physics or ballistics, medical evidence and the like, or voting systems, how things turned out, or international politics. But today we're being sold a new one that's really very straightforward, but is simply absurd on its face. And the fact that the government is giving us preposterous stories about what happened to Lloyd Austin tell us things are not on the up and up. For example, the defense secretary, we are told, is hit his hospitalization from Biden and others. This is a story that we're told rocks Washington. Remaining in collective shock Sunday last, as more information trickled out about Lloyd Austin being admitted to the hospital's intensive care unit for days and failing to disclose it to the president, the national security advisor, members of Congress, and the public. Now stop and think about it. This is the Secretary of Defense of the United States. He's in the chain of command for the use of our nuclear arsenal, among other points. He's a guy who's got 24-7 protection, just as does the president. And yet we're supposed to believe that for days he was out of communication and no one knew where he was? They're attributing to him a statement saying he understood media concerned about transparency and concede he could have done a better job ensuring the public was appropriately informed. Well, look, as a former officer in the Marine Corps, I'll tell you, this is completely absurd. There's a chain of command. Your superiors and your subordinates know where you are at all times. Here we got the claim. Austin went into the hospital on the 22nd of December. It turns out they're claiming this was for a uh, elective surgery on prostate, prostate cancer, we're going to be told. I have had prostate cancer. I've been in for surgery. And a whole lot of people knew I was, where I was, and what was going on. But in this case, his hospitalization has led to a remain secret. And he, on Monday, January 1st, he had to be admitted after experiencing severe planes complications from 22 December. Well, I think the reality that they're seeking to conceal was in fact published in a not highly reliable website called Real Raw News. And Real Raw News published in this case a winner. I think they knocked it out of the park to wit. Russian claim Austin dead in Ukraine. Here's what they reported. Criminal Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin was allegedly killed in Kiev on January 3rd when Russian cruise missiles pelted a command bunker where Austin and Lieutenant General Valery Zelazny, Commander-in-Chief of the Ukrainian Army, met secretly to discuss mounting an asymmetrical offensive, roughly that's guerrilla warfare, 
to bring Vladimir Putin to his knees. Claims a Russian FSB source known for providing invaluable intel and the truth behind Putin's special military op in Ukraine. Andrei Zakharov's tale, however, directly contradicts the administration narrative of Austin clandestinely hospitalizing himself for an unknown ailment at Walter Reed. Friday evening, a frenzied media went haywire after Politico ran an article about Austin admitting himself and staying there an entire week without notifying his criminal-in-chief, President Joseph R. Biden. The report quickly spiraled into undreamt of drama that engulfed all levels of government, with several lawmakers calling for Austin to resign for poor judgment and lack of transparency. Austin's unannounced absence has embarrassed a criminal regime struggling to stay afloat. Zakharov refutes the hospital story because he insists Austin and a bevy of Ukrainian brass were tucked away in what they thought was a secure military command center 20 feet beneath the streets of the Chensky district in central Kiev. Russian intel, he added, had, had marginal luck tracking Austin trips into and out of Ukraine since early 2023. Austin has spent so much time in Kiev, he ought to have applied for Ukrainian citizenship, he joked, adding that the secretive and self-admittedly reclusive Austin had traveled to Ukraine from Poland eight times in 2023. In early November, a spetness hunter-killer team entered Kiev undetected after learning Austin had arrived in Ukraine to personally deliver fantastic news to Zelensky, to wit, the U.S. and U.K. had voted to give him more free money and arms. The Spetnas had eyes on Austin and Zelensky, came close to killing them, but aborted the mission at the last moment due to complications. Vladimir Putin, he reported, had bestowed upon Austin the title of war criminal. Putin, he added, was delighted by Austin's demise. We knew Austin was in Ukraine. We discovered their rendezvous point. We also know the pig, Zaluni, and he's a killer of women and children, to meet his lieutenants to learn about drone warfare. They were our intended targets. Austin was a bonus. 20 cruise missiles destroyed the service buildings, collapsed the labyrinth of interconnected chambers underground, a battle damage assessment revealed a strike at raised the structures and cratered what lay beneath. Only rubble remained. Nothing on this earth could survive what we sent. Yes, he is dead. He must be dead. Real raw news American sources in the White Hat community, while stopping short of dismissing his story as wishful thinking, said they want to see irrefutable proof of Austin's death before scratching his name off their own most wanted list. However, they've called the official narrative a blatant law. Or had Austin gone to Walter Reed, their sources would have taken note and informed General Smith's office. We don't know if that Russian story is baloney or not. Our sources at Reed are unimpeachable. They say he was never there. And as far as your other question, Mike, we don't have him. If I learn more and can share, I'll let you know. Meanwhile, the situation is colossally embarrassing and only explicable if Austin actually is dead. In other words, if they have a bigger lie, they have to cover up because it's more embarrassing and would create an international sensation than the one they're shelling out. Get this. Reporters grill John Kirby on second defense Lloyd Austin, White House, can't say where Austin is today. White House National Security spokesman John Kirby could not answer a Burr's question at a Wednesday briefing on whether Secretary of Defense Austin is still in the hospital or has been released. Kirby opened his part of the briefing by telling reporters Austin had participated Tuesday with Joe Biden and other principals on the conflict in the Red Sea and the Middle East. Later, when asked where Austin was, when he took part in the briefing, a pained-looking Kirby 
shook his head in frustration and said Austin was in the hospital when he took part in the briefing on Tuesday, but referred reporters to the Pentagon for information on the current whereabouts and condition indicating a continuing failure by the White House to stay up to date on Austin. Kirby took several questions on Austin, confirming that he did not tell Biden about his prostate cancer diagnosis in their phone call on Saturday. His month-long secrecy about his cancer, followed by his secrecy of having surgery and then being hospitalized in the ICU for complications, has prompted calls by Republicans for his resignation or firing. Kirby defended Austin when a reporter questioned whether he's an essential member of the admin, given no one even noticed he was missing. The White House has said Biden has no intention of firing Austin. Here we have now the kind of ridicule to which our national security operation is being subjected as a consequence. Lloyd Austin disappearing act reveals what a joke national security is to Team Biden. For an entire week, Deputy Secretary of Defense Kathleen Hicks was in charge of the entire U.S. military, and she, they think, is the only one who knew about it, not even she. The Pentagon, Joe Biden, the White House, the DOD, and the American people had no idea. And because Biden's Defense Secretary, Lloyd Austin, didn't show up for a week, he didn't call in sick. Not only did no one know where he was, no one even realized he was gone. What does that say about the state of the U.S. military with Team Biden in charge? It was days before. Anyone at the Pentagon or the White House even noticed he was missing. How long do you suppose you could go missing from your workplace before somebody called to figure out where you are an hour? Tops? And your job is probably slightly less important than the defense of the United States. Eventually, someone figured out he was in the hospital. The story began that he was hospitalized from publication due to an elective procedure. That got the rumor mill spinning like crazy. Some believed he got it for some type of surgery for fat people. I lost the office pool since I put my money in Austin getting a sex change. It turns out that the initial story, like all initial stories from the Biden White House, was a lie. Biden wasn't hospitalized from complication for elective surgery. He underwent major surgery for prostate cancer and then got an infection. And none of the buffoons of the federal government even knew he wasn't showing up at the office. Kind of makes you wonder what Lloyd's diversity hired normal workday looks like. Does he not show up? For days at a time on a regular basis, is that why nobody noticed he was gone? The fact he kept his cancer diagnosis and surgery secret is just flat out weird. Did he put America's national security at risk out of fear Joe Biden would give his job to someone else? Kind of looks that way, doesn't it? No one ever gets held accountable for the failures of this regime. Instead of firing Austin on the spot, the Biden White House is implementing a policy review. Biden Chief of Staff Jeff Zenz sent a memo to every cabinet secretary office ordering them to tell the White House by Friday of any existing procedures for delegating authority if someone doesn't show up at work. Agencies should ensure that delegates are issued when a cabinet member is traveling in areas with limited or no access to communication undergoing hospitalization or a medical procedure requiring general anesthesia otherwise in a circumstance where he or she may be unreachable, passing the buck, in other words. This is a massive White House scandal, but the White House is trying to make it look like some sort of procedural snafu at the Pentagon. Do we really need a policy review to explain that you have to show up at work or notify someone if you're undergoing major surgery? It seems that should be one of those unwritten things people should know by the time they're getting a job at the White House. But then the Biden regime is staffed by such an army of morons that maybe they need to spell out the policy, maybe put a sign next to the one telling them to wash their hands after they pee. 
The bottom line is Austin needs to be fired at a minimum. It's unclear whether they can actually be prosecuted for dereliction of duty since he's a civilian. But jail time doesn't seem like such a bad idea compared to endangering national security the way he did. Then again, knowing how Washington functions, Austin will probably get a promotion now. Let me add, I think the delay has been they've been combing the military to find a Lloyd Austin Dommel that they've been unable to do so. He was pretty distinctive. He was a big guy with very clear features. Failing that, they're now claiming that it was Austin who was responsible for ordering the attack on Yemen, which is going to backfire big time. So it's convenient to use him as a scapegoat. You can anticipate in the near future, we're going to have a holographic representation of Lloyd off him submitting his resignation in, in with an abject apology. But it's all a complete farce to conceal the fact that the United States has been at war with Russia in Ukraine, which would be an even greater disaster for the public to access than this fantasy charade being carried out in Washington, which is so obviously farcical, so obviously contrived, so obviously incoherent, that even a third grader ought to be able to make sense that we are not being told the truth. Thanks. I liked every word. All right, Mr. Fetzer, who's uh, going next? I am. Okay, uh, which one is... Uh... Happy New Tom. All right, Tom. Tom, Tom you're next. Okay, baby. Uh, share screen, help me. I think I've got here. Is that uh, now on your screens? Yeah, I do some sermonizing. Can, can you see it? Yes. Okay. You've just heard a very realistic narrative. This is a complete fantasy. I really respect Jim, but here we go. This is a, a quote from Samuel Beckett. Try again, fail again, fail better. Before we even talk about issues, we need to talk about the mode we're in communication, which is the language that we're using or lack of it. Some trust in silence, but silence is a language too. Silence of obedience, resentment, revenge, hatred. Words may seem clumsy naming agents, but they cover the nakedness of humanity and defuse the violence of all unexpressed emotions. Thus, your words have meaning and need updating. Linguistic etymology gives us history and footprints to here and now, but we all walk in new word worlds daily and we must rely upon their precision. The failure of Esperanto as a world language forces us to reconsider dialects and deviations of meaning via accents and context. Renaming always happens. Cambodia becomes Kampuchea, Leningrad returns to St. Petersburg, who names rules. The white invasion of Australia was so swift and so brutal that Aboriginal names sometimes survived in the landscape. Uluru, Katabira, Warakana, Canberra, Murray. Even when Uluru was renamed as Rock, then renamed back again, married women sometimes change their name, then reclaim their maiden name upon divorce. People in transition choose names appropriate to their changing. What we call people, whether slur, gossip or prey, stays. You can sue somebody, but why bother? Once, Indigenous Aborigines had over 300 languages and just as many dialects. With their extermination, only 65 survived, and some of them only partially. Do you remember when Gaelic was suppressed and Welsh? Now road signs spring up and sing diversity, and spoken and sung languages spring back to life, just like us. So uh, that's the first one. And I'll, I'll line up the second one as soon as I can work out the technology of this strange world. Um, Charles, can you help me get the next one, which is um, it's called On the First Day? Uh, I'll, look, I'll look in my inbox and see if we can do. Yeah, here we go. Okay. Open it, open it and then screen share. Okay. I've just opened it, and now I'm going to screen share. Yep, here we go. Uh, I spoke about 
the use of the languages. Now, a lot of us in this new year, allegedly new year, all want to change things. So this is questioning whether change is possible. 2024 affirmations and resolutions. On the first day of 2024, my actionable affirmations will be resolutions for an immediate ceasefire everywhere. Peace dividends to turn the Pentagon budget into parks, gardens, forest healing, and hospice curation. Turn the arms industry into healing by artificial limbs for all already war-torn veterans needing replacement and replenishment. To have counselors replace security guards and police in schools at all levels. To encourage reading of all banned, censored, edited books in library, schools, coffee shops, and community centers. To restore bodily autonomy to all ages, sexes, choices, and transitions. To expand curricula, including philosophy, rhetoric, poetry, art, music, etc. To re-allow migrant workers in for harvest, field, and farm work and art exchanges. To plant fruit and nut trees for homeless to harvest and enjoy. To open all military bases as homeless shelters. To expand solar, geothermal, wind and water powers as renewable, reliable resources. To encourage free libraries, free food banks, free clothing exchanges. To restore bicycles, unicycles, tricycles as personal transport options. To replace all smartphones with conversations like this one and dialogues as our Esperanto. To listen more than I speak, respect all your diverse opinions, to ask you what your resolutions might be, and to implement as many as possible. To play more than work and enjoy every moment of these infinite lifetimes with more lifelines like this one. So take that one. And here's the next one. It's coming up as soon as I can work it out. That's right. It goes like, my goodness gracious, I have to screen sharing. So, uh, yep, uh, I have to get back to get back to here and then go back to screen share. Oh, technology. Here we go. Okay, one, two, three, four. Right. Uh, this is an impossible idea. You know what Lewis Carroll said? Oh, Alice in, in, in uh, one lane. We must have three impossible ideas before breakfast. So this is the third one. It's called shape-shifting. If we truly are each other, then we all have 8 billion lives to share. My first billion will be spent reading all languages, all cultures, all styles, much to learn there, and it will take at least one lifetime. Next to meet the remaining 7 billion human beings with all their languages, histories, intimacy, communities, because they all have families and friends and frenemies too. This will steal another billion lives. Next, I will move to nature's diverse ways, all biology, botany, etymology, archaeology, from day one to 2025. This may take a few lifetimes, as there are more ants and cockroaches than human beings, more varieties of species extinct than our pole reversals, more end times for dodos and unicorns, while new species extend varieties into the cornucopia of our multi-species lives. All that is living deserves another billion learning experiences. Then all consciousness of stars, plants, galaxies, constellations, all the way to Planet X and Nibiru. There goes a few billion light years learning. All that is, was, and is emergent into becoming. Suddenly, here we are back at square one, day one, not the end times, more this new year, 2024, where we all have opportunities to love and to learn from everyone and everything that really is. So I'm wishing you all another billion milli moments to enjoy the worlds you inhabit now have ever inhabited and will inhabit post this lifetime and all the next lives are waiting to learn you. So that's number three. And uh, if I knew how to use this, it would probably be easier. Here's another one. Uh, just like the other one, only different. Here we go. So back to screen sharing. Back to where am I? Ah, confusion, man. I am screen sharing. I know. Now, how do I get into it? I go back. I'm talking to myself, but don't listen. I don't. Uh, Charles, help me on this one. I've got it lined up, but how do I get into the screen sharing bit? New share. New share. That's it. New share. On the bottom in green. Yeah, but my bottom is uh, tied up with a VPN at the moment. Bring, I don't... The, bring the cursor down. Oh, okay. Thank you. I'm still 16th century in all this world. 
bringing the cursor down. Come and on, the toolbox cursor. should show up. It should, I know. People should be nice too. Okay, it's coming down. I almost saw it. Okay, come on. I'm I'm in the email at the moment. Oh no, no, go away. Go away. I don't want you VPN. I'm not here. Okay. Okay. I'm I'm trying hard to get into the real world, but I never made it. Ah uh, I, I can't get to the bottom part. I've got I've got the um the poem lined up and that's there. Uh well clicking new share. Oh, I think I've done. My goodness gracious. Okay. Now what we always have to do, of course, is uh, yeah. which one is it? Let's see, this is it. Okay, share. Yeah, this is it. Can you see that one? Hello? Anyone out there? Are you all frozen? In there, done, done that. Yes, that's it. Thank you. We are doing this right now, but people are burning money, blowing rockets up, trying to get through the pollution we've created to get to another planet to pollute. And the question we must ask is, like all the money spent on the Pentagon budget and all the money spent on the space budget, uh, this is a complete waste of money. It's all money up in smoke, whether it be ammunition up in smoke, as we see every day from Ukraine, or um, a, another Tesla rocket, boom, boom, SpaceX, X'd out. So my question is this, do we have any power to control where our resources are devoted to? You heard in the first poem, I want us to put into libraries, into parks and gardens and homelessness. And this is the second part of that. What good would another moon landing do? Been there, done that. All we brought back was moon rocks and moon dust. How many times must we repeat, 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 repeat the past? Billions spent on exploding rockets and dead astronauts. We've all watched the movies from Apollo 11 to Avatar. We saw our first live transmission in that Kennedy administration, and every president salivates to repeat, repeat, repeat that alleged miracle moon landing. Whether Stanley Kubrick recreated it in some studio or not, 2001 A Space Odyssey still remains a cinematic time capsule. But why burn our budgets to revisit moon's rocky dust surface? A moon base for mining asteroids, a film set for Avatar, Avatar 3, a stage for recreation of Pink Floyd's dark side of the moon, a waste of resources while Earth is burning with climate chaos and starvation. Feed their needs before flying off to planetary oblivions. In space, no one can hear you scream. Stay on Earth as this is Eden and heaven there's only a place for life to give birth again, and rocks do not breed anything, and water is required, so honour our blue planet now. There is no planet B. Okay, you patient people, that's me. What do you got to say, Kelvin? Right, thank you. Thanks a lot. All right, who's next? Me, I'm Dan Weinberg. All right, Danny, go for I'm it. Next. Let's see. Uh, there he is. I'm, uh, I'm over here. Yeah. What's that, heat in your house? Uh, there's a little bit of heat in the house, yeah. You just can't afford it. Huh? Didn't pay your utility bill? Yeah, we're saving, saving the move to Las Vegas. I'm getting my stuff. <clears throat> you say okay, so. Can you say we're saving on thermostat? We're saving on the thermostat. Yeah. Loud. Got a pizza too. I think they can. Can you hear me? Yes, go. Please start. Okay. All right. So my talk is about health. So I want to show us. Can I share screen, Tim? Oh, shit. What you can doing? share the screen yourself. Call okay, up the screen. item, open it. And then hit go to share screen. Yeah, you could share it, Dan. It's it's all enabled for everybody. So go ahead and uh share. All screen. right. Can you see what I have on the screen? Food is medicine. Yeah, no, you just gotta hit the share screen button. Click the screen you want to share, and it should come right up. Wait, I I gotta go down a little bit. On the bottom, 
If it's yeah, here. no, I, I can't see I can't see the bottom. Is the document up but bring your cursor down then? Yeah. Built in display. Wait, choose what you share there with uh oh, here maybe. See it, Dan? I see, but I think I can't get down. I can't scroll down for some reason. Bring your cursor down. I'm trying. I got it down, but it, the, the screen won't move. No, just stop. Can you, can you give me the you have privileges? Access. You have privileges to share screen. Yeah, I, I just messed up with this. Um, well, anyways, what I got, what I got, I'll tell you, I'll read, I'll read it. Food is medicine. It's a current initiative of the liberal Rockefeller Foundation. So what they say is good food is a cornerstone of good health. Yet many Americans, especially black, indigenous, people of color and low income communities lack access to affordable, nutritious food. The result, a 1.1 trillion healthcare bill for the diet related diseases equal to all the money we currently spend on food itself. So don't talk, quit saying that. Quit saying that. I'm speaking loud enough, they can hear me. Yeah, they can. Maybe yeah, you can, can hear, hear yeah. me. Loud and clear. Loud and clear. You're the best, bro. All right, and then there's President Biden. He had a, he had a, uh, Dan, you're out. I know. All right. All right. All right. Let me, let me. What do you know? Speak louder. I'm clear. Lana? What? <laughs> I don't know. All right, what, what Biden is talking about. There was a conference at the White House in, on hunger, nutrition, and health. And so <clears throat> what he did, what he talked, what he's talking about is a lot of money went to a lot of different places in America from the government for um, for uh, for help for food. So the Biden Harris administration announced more than eight billion dollars in new commitments for uh, white on a White House conference of hunger, nutrition, and health. So basically, there's money for uh, like AARP is getting money for food for older people, and uh, benefits are going up. There's different groups around the country that are getting money for produce there's a uh, there's a veterans initiative called produce for health they get uh, forty dollars a month which isn't that much for lettuce and tomatoes and uh, so they change their diet and they be more healthy and isn't that good and that's what we all want we want people to be healthy so um Let's see what I'm doing here. Let me get back. I can't get out of it. Let me see. Why don't you just talk? All right, I'll just talk. So, so why buy food at a farmer's market? Now, some people might think a Cadillac car, why is a Cadillac car more expensive than a Honda Civic? Is it better? Does it yeah. run better? Yeah. yeah. And so its quality is better. Would you say its quality is better? Because sometimes yeah. import parts. Parts import. Yeah, yeah import parts. And that raises the price of hundred to hundred thousand dollars. Or a Maserati. Is a Maserati better than a Cadillac? So you have to pay so somebody would have to pay more for a, a Maserati than a Cadillac? And a Honda than a used uh, Toyota. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, of course. Oh, of course. Okay. 
So what about the idea of food? Is there better food also? So is a, a McDonald's hamburger, there's a McDonald's hamburger, for instance, and then there's grass-fed beef. Now, is grass-fed beef better than McDonald's hamburger? Is it more nutritious? Will it give you more vitamins and minerals? I see you don't know. So part Neither of it do is... You. Neither do you. I don't know. You're right. So it's tr it's a it's a it's a matter of trust, and it's a matter of um, believing in something. Let me let me uh, fix my timer there. Okay, got my timer going. Okay, so it's believing. What do you believe? What do people believe in the society? Do you believe that McDonald's is poisoning you, or giving you bad food, or are you going to a farmer's market because you want to be healthier or maybe healthy at all? And maybe if you're spending $100 a month on medication for high blood pressure, heart problems, stroke problems, uh, diabetes, um, dementia, uh, liver problems, if you're spending $50 or $100 or $200 a month, now, is that medicine is food. As I said, the Rockefeller Foundation has a, has a program called Food as Medicine. If you, if you Google Food as Medicine on uh, PubMed, the publisher, the medical publications, uh, National Library of Medicine, you probably know this, Charlie, the National Library of Medicine database, there are 300,000 hits you'll get as food as medicine. So doctors, big shot doctors and nurses and nutritionists, they all study this stuff. And they think that uh, food is medicine. Actually, some of them study medicine and food so closely that, uh, that they, uh, I, need they, and I go to a drugstore. I don't go to the grocery store. It's it's a way it's a way of thinking, Charlie. It's how you think about food. Now, food, what is food? It's something that grows in soil, in dirt, usually, unless you you grind it up into little pieces and then put it in a plastic bag and throw it onto the shelf in the grocery store. Now Food, to me, is fruits and vegetables and whole grains. <laughs> I, sound like a, I sound like a communist or something. I mean, you can call me a socialist. You can call me a radical, liberal tree hugger, but just don't call me late for dinner. Okay. I'll speak louder, Lana. I'll start shouting now. I'm talking loud enough. Anyways, so it's a way of thinking in America. Because corporations own the airwaves, they own the the newspapers, magazines. There's nothing. There's very little, let's say, of natural food, and people people look down on it. They say, "Oh, they're the tree huggers. They got gardens. They got big gardens." Like in Chicago, there's the South Chicago farm. It's three acres of growing stuff, and maybe they sell a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars a year. So is that a big garden? I guess it is a big garden, but they are servicing people who don't have a, have a grocery store within miles. So it's a food desert. So they grow vegetables and fruit. It's on 90th and Mackinac. And 90th and Mackinac is by the, by the confluence of the Lake Michigan and you can see the skyway from the from the farm and uh, the road to indiana it's by actually, actually it's by the 30 bus you can take the 30 bus there the one that goes to hedgewish which is the south shore stop and uh get off at about 90th and street before mackinac and you can walk two blocks and walk to the farmer's market and they have and they have, uh, I highly recommend their 
tomatoes because they're only $2 a pound, which is really cheap for farmers markets. And they're juicy and they're full of goodness and gracious and vitamins and minerals. And uh, I bought them and I take the red line and it takes me two hours to get there each way. So I take the red line from Loyola to 69th and get the 30 bus there. And it goes east, takes about 20 minutes to drive to uh, 90th and Mackinac, around 90th and Mackinac, then I walk two blocks. And uh, also, I mean, the South Sh Chicago place, you can also volunteer there. And they'll probably give you a bag of goodies to take home and, and for free. So anyways, when I bought the stuff there, I took the train and I took two bags of groceries on the bus and it was no problem on the red line. I just ride in the front car, just ride with the front first car. It's the safest car. Uh, let me try to fix this again. I can see behind you, me. Uh, is this? Anyway, so what else have I got? So farmers markets, of course, you have to have you have to trust in the farmer. So I mean, people who live in cities don't run into farmers very much. Their farmers are very strange people. They're nobody. How many people know a farmer? Raise your hand. Oh, I can't see it, your hands, but. Probably nobody knows a farmer now today who's farming. I know, a bunch and I know a few because I buy at farmers markets, and they're just what? I have quite a few out of my church. You know one? Yeah. About do ten they have of them. Ten of them. Do yeah. they have? Do they have corn bean bean and soy corn farms or vegetable farms? It depends on what you, what type of farmer you got. You know, right. Well, I mean, have you gone to their farms? There no. was one that I knew Why? All right. All right. Anyways, so uh, I know farmers, and farmers are regular people, just like you and me, except they do something very important. When God created the, the land, Republican. The Republican, God, farmers are Republicans. They're all Republicans. Yeah. I don't I don't think so. No, that's a myth. That's an urban myth. Just like all all people in Chicago are, are liberals. That's an urban myth too. I hate a lot of a lot of conservative people I know. Right back. All right, let's wrap it up, Dan. All right. Anyways. So wait, let me get some technical information. Why do you guys got your coats on in the inside? All right, so, so instead of buying a $6 box of Coke or $6 worth of crackers or cookies or cake or muffins, you could buy some tomatoes at a farmer's market. I mean, a box of crackers costs about $6 a pound. So, I mean, you might as well buy some tomatoes. And they'll be more healthy. So there are different um, phytochemicals, phyto, phyto, phytochemicals that have antioxidant properties. Got <laughs> Taking notes. You can't bake nutritious cookies. What? You can't bake nutritious cookies. You can't bake nutritious cookies. It depends on how much sugar you put in. Sugar is not a health healthy thing. So phytochemicals fight, improve immune function. They prevent cancer. They protect your brain. <laughs> they support heart health. Cancer and food at PubMed, 10,500 hits. Yeah, you're a farmer. So the, the, right, the no up. wait no wait I'm not done. So the health health statistics for the USA are very low. 
in the 40 OECD com uh, countries, you, the USA is last in, in, uh, in statistics, health statistics. And the, the lower um, lifespan, it keeps going, it's going down in the last few years. So, I mean, the average, average age of uh, average lifespan at birth is 77 years for America. For other, <laughs> Japan and France, Germany, it's up to 80. But they don't have the same problems America does. So there's, there's a reason for that. So anyways, so what is the relationship of the, Russian, of the FDA, the EPA, and the USDA? <laughs> All those three parts of the government are very filled with corporation, people like from Monsanto, from Archer Daniels Midland, from Cisco, from other big food companies. Companies, and how can they regulate the food companies when they are part of the food company? So, of course, they allow these big factory farms where pigs are treated like, like dogs and they're given a lot of antibiotics and then they're sold. And then people eat the antibiotics and they get sick. So big deal. Who cares? All they care about is making money. And... Also, uh, the uh, pesticide is yep. is highly it's highly used. Yes, it is. That's true. The flavor pesticide, if you like. <laughs> so, a good book to read is how what my food ate. <laughs> so, plants go in the soil. They don't just sit in the soil. They exchange they exchange chemicals with the soil, with uh, the anti, with the the small animals that are in the soil, the microorganisms. The microorganisms eat the sugar that the plant gives off in their roots, and then the, the microorganisms die, and the plant uptakes their uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, and they get they grow. So there's a symbiotic relationship between the soil and the plant. And when you when when nitrogen phos NPK is used, when bags of nitrogen are used, it, the same uh, system does not work. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mike, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Give me a second here, Mike. I got to get your presentation up. All right, Mr. Lehman, don't go, no, go up front. You can go. Well, people hear me? Yeah, they'll hear you if you get to the mic and speak into it. They can. FYI. You got to be loud like you were before, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. He's not. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, In Europe, every product is labeled A through F for food quality. So you know when you're eating garbage. But of course, in America, we eat garbage. Mike, a little louder. Can you hear me now? Mike, just speak up like you're projecting your voice to the room. Can everybody hear me? Well, speak, like I said, get your voice up. The microphone's working fine. Can everybody no, hear me? No, it's not. Oh, they can't hear me. Well, speak. Like I said, kind of shout, like out into the room. I am shouting. Well, can no. you hear me now? Mike, you okay? They can hear you now. Just go I loud. Don't know. Well, they're all. Turn the comments. All right, Mike, just go ahead and start. Well, what, can, they, can you guys hear me? Yeah, they can hear Why you. Why don't you sit next to them? Sit next to Tim. I'm speaking from across the room loudly. Mike, can you just... hear me now? 
Yeah, they can hear you now, Mike. Why can't they respond back? Well, they they're responding back. They they're looking at the screen. Just speak loudly. Okay, That's bring it. up my PowerPoint. So my my whole presentation. PowerPoint. All right. Well, I'm going to bring that up now. Okay, hang on a second. Let me share a screen on it. We'll get it ready. Grab the mic in your hand and speak directly into it. Just grab the mic directly and just speak into it directly. Hello. Hello, everybody. I'll be Zoom land. Can you hear Mike now? Yeah, see? You can they hear can me hear now? you. Yeah. Okay. Now just let me get Wait, your presentation. I, gotta show. I, I, put, I grabbed a bunch of, I stole screenshots. From the internet. Okay, there's your PowerPoint. Yeah, the, do the first one. The that's what we're doing, Mike. Can't, can't hear him well. Well, that's can't. what I'm saying. You know, he's got to speak a little louder. Can you hear me now? Okay, Mike, go, go ahead. ahead. All right, go ahead with the first slide. I'm just going to narrate. Them. Okay, so I wanted to kind of look. I haven't looked at petroleum and oil. Since all our wars are basically about oil anymore, oil, petroleum, land, oil, gas, natural gas, of course, pipelines. So I wanted to take a look at petroleum products and oil just to get a primer. And I haven't looked at this stuff probably in 10 years, five or 10 years. So anyway, um, this is like looking at a, Okay, so basically, yeah. So most of what the oil goes to is gasoline, jet fuel, fuel oil. You know, about eighty percent of it goes to transportation, or seventy percent, and the rest is industrial. So I just wanted to take a look at that and uh, see where it goes, but oil. oil Pretty much transportation, your cars, your planes, trucks. Louder, Mike. Can you hear me now? Yeah, they can. Just speak loud. All right. Go yeah. ahead. Next slide. Okay. And this seems like it's accurate. You got to be careful with anything on the internet. I mean, sometimes people just copy, paste, they look at charts, they look at fake news. You got to kind of like look at a couple things. To sort it out, fact check things. But this looks like it's pretty accurate. I'm going to go with that. Million barrels per day, which equals world oil production, which equals um, America. America's like 25%. 25%. Louder, Mike. I think America's about 25% of all oil. So this is just uh, world oil usage. Per, World crude oil production per year over time. Per day. Per day from yeah, 1991 so, to 2021. Yeah, so 80 million barrels a day in the world. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting, it's still increasing, as you can see, up to 2020. That was COVID, where it dropped, but now it's going back up again. So we still burn, baby, burn, drill, baby, drill. That's still going on. That ain't going to end. I could tell. Next. Next, please. All right. So everybody thinks this is a panacea. Like, we're all going to go electric. We're all going to scoot around in electric vehicles. Electric cars are going to save the world. Elon Musk is going to save us all from destruction and death and mayhem. So, now... Somewhat accurate, I think. I was looking at other charts, and you know, EVs, electric vehicles. Now, this is kind of scary. Mike. This is why do I gotta scream into this fucking uh, thing? Because they're not hearing you. Just can you hear me now? Yeah, they can. Go ahead, Mike. <laughs> so anyway, China has like what five times the people of America, four times the people. So yes. of course, of course, they're gonna be. One, 1 million EVs a year. And as you can see, America is kind of flatlined on EVs. So my question to you in the audience is, are EVs just a novelty? Is it just a fashion statement? Is it just something that, like, 
greenwashing? Is it just something that's like for the rich? Will it only have one or two percent of the market forever? You know, is this bullshit? Is Elon Musk full of bullshit also? I think so. So anyway, so you know, Americans buy about what about three hundred thousand. Mike, why don't you go back where you go what? back where you were? Go what? back where you just went and speak. Right there. Turn around. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Stay there. Stay here. Okay. So, you know, two million world sales, two million cars, electric vehicles, plug-ins. I guess they call them. I think they're all plug-ins. I guess you have the batteries. You plug them in. I wish Andy was here. He could help me out with that. But anyway, so China's, of course, going to be a higher rate because they have all that technology and probably lower costs and better subsidies. So they're going to have four times as many EVs sold. But this is such a small amount. I mean, America's buying a half, not even half a million EVs a year. And you know how many cars, gasoline cars? America buys every year? Tim, take a guess. I have no idea. David? One million. More? Six million. More? Ten million. More? What? Sixteen million. <laughs> That's about right. So, sixteen million gasoline cars still every year, and yeah, look at that orange line, if you can see it, U.S. sales. Now, of course, everybody in the world, including Elon salesman Elon Musk, is going to tell you, hey, get on board. Get on this train. Buy EVs. Tim, get rid of your Scion. Buy an electric vehicle for double the price. Okay, so that's where we are, so... Electric vehicles might be bullshit. Okay, next slide, please. I'm talking about there are ten million. There are ten million cars produced worldwide every year. I spoke oh, on this. Fifteen million. One, in America. No, America. it is not. Ten million worldwide. At twenty percent are are electric. Yeah, that's that's greenwashing. Okay, two thousand nineteen. Okay, we'll see this in the charts. I I looked up some pretty decent charts here. Eighty four thousand in uh twenty nineteen and two hundred and forty four thousand. All electric cars are plug-in hybrids. Are the ones we have plugged it in? They're all plug-in hybrids. I don't know why they, you know, because a plug-in plug hybrid has plugs it in and it has a gas engine that assists it. That's how. That's what a plug-in hybrid is. Like your uh, Chevy, like your Chevy Volt uh -huh. or your Honda Insight. Anyway, my point here is on this slide would be that again. There's 15 million cars sold in America every year and, and less than half a million of EVs. Okay, go ahead, Tim. Next one. Here you go, Charlie. There are 15 million cars. Here you there go, 15 Charlie. million cars hey. made it. Go read that. Read that top line, Charlie. Historical cars to sales data in the U.S. That's probably including used cars. Not just new ones. Good point. Good point, Tim. Yeah. That's why you got to really read this shit. You don't know if they're lying or it's fake or it's been described properly. I can't see the bottom on any of these charts. I don't know if anybody else is having the same problem. I can see the top just I'll fine. I'll read it to you. Okay, go, go back to the beginning. Mike. No? Okay, just, keep, just keep going. Yeah. 
In other words, I can see the yeah. top and the, the top title line. Danny, it's, you can never read those. It's too small on computers. Basically, it's the last 10 or 20 years. This one's okay. 30. This so one's you have years across the bottom. Usually, yes. that's what it's okay. Like. Uh, okay, here's the uh, number of vehicles registered. Yeah. Well, all right. So there's a, you know, almost one vehicle per person in America. I tried to research, you know, in Europe, since Europe's kind of close and actually more responsible and more sustainable and has better transportation systems, of course. So I want, but it's kind of hard because it's multiple countries. And I just couldn't run into the right charts. Uh, anyway, so yeah, we're close to uh, one car per person or one SUV. All right, go ahead, Tim. Okay, this might have been kind of greenwashed. Again, this chart, this one is from, okay, this is from. Uh, uh, hang on, Mike. I think we got, uh, I hit one, two, Yeah, basically these are the last, well, this one's from 20. Mike, I'm getting it back up, okay? Basically the, you know, the, the year is the last 10 or 20 years, 30 maybe, but this one for some reason I put up here, well, because this is kind of where the growth in uh, EVs are. So this is from 2020. 22. This is the percentage of all vehicles. So this is in sales. <coughs> Fuck. I... That's all right. That's all right. I'll just go on to this one. Okay. So, you know, basically the Tesla models are much more than all the next five or six combined. America. So you got the you know, but there's still only like, you know, less than a half a million. Okay. And what else did I want? Any other ones? Okay. Let me see why I like this one. Maybe percentage of new sales. Okay, but this is going out. Ernie, this is going out to 2040. So, of course, this is going to okay. be fake news. Oh, so, you know, this is the optimistic Elon Musk's and salesman saying that everything's going to go easy. And, you know, as you can see, we're down here around 2% in 2020, 5%. And then they're saying 30%, which... We'll see. I'm not going to be around in 2040, I don't think. But anyway, there's a lot of greenwashing and bullshit and salesmanship. But, you know, Elon Musk, he's making a lot of money, that boy. Hopefully he puts his money to good use. Next. Builds bullet trains. All right. Yeah, next one. Oh, uh, you know what? We saw this one already. Go ahead. That's the end of it. You didn't have the ones about fatalities? Ernie, I had another two charts. On, it's related to cars. On uh, what? I had another couple charts on uh, related to oil and vehicles, and it was fatality. We're still pretty flatlined. There's 8,000 people killed, bicyclists and pedestrians are uh -huh. still killed every year. Uh, an American road. I'll have it up in a second. I got to pull it up from email. It wasn't included in your presentation. It's going to take a minute to pull. So but I think I know where it's at. That's pretty much. I just wanted to say, Ernie, if you would have died, heaven forbid, you would have been part of 8 million people or 8,000 people that year. Yeah. But you're with us. You're our next speaker. Yeah. Now hang on. Well, all right. We'll just, we'll just let it go. So it's it's pretty much a shame that, you know, like even Michigan Avenue. Why the fuck are people? Can we say the here. Yeah, go ahead. Like, why the hell are people driving 50, 60 miles per hour uh, down Michigan Avenue, where there's like a million pedestrians every day crossing streets? Think about it. 
It's just it's stupid. <laughs> Some of these streets are so fast and you got all these morons. As we know, there's a lot of idiot drivers. Always has been. But Ernie, I threw that out there just to show you the costs and, and problem, other problems. There's all kinds of problems with cars and personal vehicles and oil. Okay, it Mike. on and on. Wait, hold on. Let me check my list. Hey, Dan. Plus, you left the building. No, he's here. Yeah. You know, in Europe, they rate every product A to F for quality, for food, food quality. It's really? Yeah. It's on every goddamn label in Europe. It's like, if you're going to eat garbage, it's got an F on it. Wow. It, or if it's got, you know, it's got, if it's got hormones and antibiotics. What country, what country are you talking everyone. about? Everyone. The everyone, EU. Italy, you know what France, the EU is? everyone. It's the European. Wow. wow. If you're gonna know, but they, this country, they don't hey. let they, they don't let Roundup in there either. They passed the Probably law not. against Roundup. They have, they have regulations, but this country, it's like you're on your own pal. Right. right. All right. Hold on. Let me check my notes here. David, did you have any questions? No. We'll get them. We'll get to them in a little bit. Charlie, I don't are know we going to do questions open. after each speaker, or are we going to do them all at the end? We're going to do them all at the end, sir. Ernie, you're going to go next. All right. Okay. Um, all right. I don't I, know why Charlie yelled at him. I no idea what he's talking about. Never let him. Uh, okay, Ernie, you're next. All right. Let me. Let me. Go just ahead. I don't have any charts or anything. I just got. I have my notes here. I want to kind of. See if I can refer to. Um, give me a second here. Um, wait a second. Wait a second. I am. Go home. Oh, really? You got to you got to put me in big on that. Gee, I wish I could just talk. Anyway, that's okay. Um, the topic that I want to talk about tonight is a topic which is really all over the news and people are talking about it everywhere and that is the situation in israel and gaza in the in the uh in the eastern mediterranean um i guess my primary purpose is i'd like to hear more discussion of it here at the college of complexes now i did note when charlie read the upcoming schedule that we are going to have somebody i believe it's march 2nd that is going to talk about this topic. And I'm I'm happy about that. I'm looking forward to that. But I think it's very important. Uh, it's important to us as Americans because we're we're all but involved with both feet. And and it's something we should be uh, we should be talking about even more than we are. And particularly our group consists of uh, of intelligent, generally well-informed people and people who are interested and concerned about what's going on in the world, what our government is doing, uh, and and who seek information on this. And not just superficial information, but in some breadth and depth. And, uh, you know, most groups, when you, when you go to a group to hear a talk about anything or you hear a reporter talking about it, there's usually... Uh, a baked in uh, collective opinion or at least a prejudice which which you can sometimes spot sometimes you can't but you, it's it's difficult to get a completely objective uh, view and I will say with regard to this Israel and Gaza thing I think our media is much more open and much more fair and broad-minded and showing both sides than than our government is okay the the yeah. the uh, the reporters are 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 on both sides of the issue and and talking about it extensively. That part is good. What is not good, I think, is is the positions that our government is taking, and we need to talk about that. Uh, one of the things that's good about the college is that we we uh, we like to uh, call ourselves a free speech forum, where all views are welcome. And whether they're popular or not, uh, in fact, the the college is, has kind of become a home for <laughs> off-center views and issues. 
That's one of the reasons I love this place. Uh, and it's kind of the, the last hope for crazy ideas. And sometimes those crazy ideas actually turned out to be visionary. So I, I would like to see us talking about it more. I'd like to see us perhaps have a panel. Now, maybe we should have a current affairs panel every month or two or three uh, in which whatever the current issues are, we have a discussion, get two or three people up there to state their opinions and take questions and so on uh, and so forth. Now, um, I think I, the, the, there seems to be some common views on this, and I don't think they, they, they uh, are, all are getting the point the way I see it. Um, I attended a, a two-day seminar, and I recommend this to people. I attended most of a two-day seminar symposium sponsored by Rainbow Push. Uh, it was live down at their headquarters down in Hyde Park. I and saw it too, Ernie. Did you see it? Who, who's who spoke? Damn. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Did you it was, like it? yeah, it was good. It was incredible. It was it yeah. was uh, most of the day yesterday and much of the day today. They had uh, well, just some of the speakers here. I'll read Cornell West was great. He was yesterday. James Zogby was one of the uh, uh, of the uh, masters of ceremony, shall we say. There were several U.S. congressmen and women, several state legislatures. Uh, social workers, uh, uh, aid workers, you know, from uh, uh, non-governmental organizations and, and administrators and writers, college professors, etc. Just a whole lot of people with a lot of knowledge and a lot of great information. Now, there was one central focus, as you might as you might expect. And that's that's fine. The uh, Operation Push is kind of a peacenik organization. What they're looking for, and a lot of people are asking for, is a ceasefire now. And the logic is, let's stop the killing now. We aren't going to be able to come to any kind of a reasonable discussion or conclusion until the until the fighting stops. And I think that this makes sense. But I think I'm looking uh, in two directions. I'm looking to how this whole got this whole thing got started, and what do we do when it's done? What happens when the when the fighting is over? I mean, uh, a few weeks ago, they said 45% of the residential units in Gaza have been destroyed. By now, it's probably well more than half. I mean, you look at the pictures, Gaza looks worse than, than uh, or about as bad as Hiroshima after the atom bomb. Not quite, but it's in pretty bad shape, like like uh, many European cities after World War II. Uh, so, so obviously there are a lot of problems there. Who's going to take care of this? I mean, the, the, uh, Israelis are saying, well, go, go from Northern Gaza into Southern Gaza and you'll be okay. But turns out, no, that wasn't the case. And, uh, Northern Gaza has been, been, uh, pretty much wiped out, but just in the last couple of days, they said, well, they're going to give some permission to people to go back to Northern Gaza, but, but where are they going to go back to, you know, piles of rubble. And uh, so that that is not going to uh, work well. Uh, there's got to be a major long term solution. Now, one of the interesting things, uh, James Zogby uh, and his organization had done a poll. And there have been many such polls, but this one seemed to be more detailed. And the poll basically shows uh, that he showed maybe eight or ten different slides or more. And and the the thing to be gathered from all of these slides, as I saw them, is that Americans as a whole are not happy with our with our government's uh, handling of this. Uh, yeah. Most of our uh, most people in the U.S. think that the that our government is is way leaning to, leaning toward Israel's point of view and supporting Israel much more than they should be. And uh, there were a variety of, of slides, uh, with one exception, the Republicans. The Republicans think that the government is doing fine, which is ironic. But uh, and uh, Democrats and young people seem to line up. To, they're like three to one in favor of a more balanced view. And almost everybody is in favor of a, uh, a, a ceasefire to, to, you know, to, to take a few steps back and, and talk about the situation a little bit. Um, I think that this this uh, uh, whole session now it, it's time consuming. It was almost two full days, uh, at least five hours or six hours of sessions yesterday and three or four today. 
Uh, I think it's on YouTube. If you go to Operation Rainbow Push is what it's called. If you go to, to their area on YouTube, you should be able to find it. Now, uh, and I, I, I do recommend it. Um, a very, very brief history. I'm not going to go through all the dates uh, on this, but a lot of people say, well, this whole incident that's taking place now started on October the 7th of last year uh, when, when Hamas attacked uh, southern Israel. Uh, others uh, go back to 1948, the founding of Israel, and they said that's the problem. A lot of other people pick dates in between. Uh, personally, I view this as a problem which had its roots back in the end of the 19th century uh, when Herzl started uh, writing and advocating for a Zionist position of, you know, Israel has a right to this land. They've been gone for a couple thousand years, but it's still their land. And there were many Jews living in Israel at the time, or, or what was then called Palestine. And uh, but more started moving in. Uh, this caused some problems, some dust ups uh, and riots back even as early as the 1920s. And then, of course, with World War II, uh, we had the Holocaust, which which uh, created uh, sympathy, at least for the notion that the Jews should have their own state so they would be safe. And uh, that's one of the things that enabled uh, enabled the, the Zionist uh, uh, um, lobbyists to get the whole thing passed and Israel became a state in 1948. And of course, as we know, right from the beginning and right up today, there have been problems. Okay. It just, it just is not something where, where uh, <laughs> they, they got the agreement of both parties. Let's put it this way. Um, it, you, some people compare this uh, I compare this in a way, and I compare Netanyahu to Andrew Jackson, and I compare what 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 uh, is happening in Israel to what was happening in the uh, uh, colonies, the early colonies back in the 1800s, when, uh, when when we tried to push the the Indians from their ancestral lands further west. Now, the advantage that we had is at least we 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 had a place to push them. OK, there's no place to push the Palestinians, really. It's it's uh, it's uh, just a very big problem that way. It's it's box and it's 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 overpopulated as it is. Um, I guess the way I see it uh, and I, I want everybody else to support. I want to hear a lot of points of views on this. this is why I'm proposing that we have more sessions on this and we maybe have some panels and discussions. Uh, I see there are, th there are three things I think that have to happen. First of all, Israel uh, has to uh, overcome the Lakudian and what I call the Andro-Jacksonian view that, that they have the right to rule from the river to the sea. They quote this thing uh, they, they, with fear about the, the Palestinians are saying freedom from the river to the sea. And what some of those Palestinians admittedly mean is they want all of it and they don't want any Jews there. But I think most Palestinians mean they want a free and equal share for Palestinians in that area. Now, the Likuds, and I think most Israelis, a lot of Israelis feel that way. Uh, and, and Netanyahu was was on the ropes before this happened. It's one of these cases, the, the wag the dog situations, where a war is, is kind of... Uh, extended Netanyahu's ability to govern even when he's very unpopular uh, because you know when there's when there's a war when there's a threat people people kind of get together around a leader whether it's a good leader or, or, or not a good leader uh, but I think the Slaykudian view has got to be moderated uh, and that that's that's up to the Israel uh, the Israelis now our government has to put pressure this is number two our government has to put pressure on Israel uh, to accept and live by uh, a fair solution for all. Some, like Oslo, Oslo is not perfect, but something uh, similar to that. And they have to abide by it, which they have not, they have not abided by much of anything. Uh, they're, they're, uh, the, the biggest problem, of course, are the settlements, but there are a lot of others too. They just, uh, uh, there's a lot of, uh, indignities and and uh oppression that the palestinians 
uh, are subjected to. They are not. They are not equal citizens by any stretch, and they're not even equal citizens in their own areas. Okay. Uh, and why why is it now that our government does this? Well, our our leaders perceive that if they if they don't go, you know, one hundred percent, you know, salute the flag in favor of Israel, the Jewish voters uh, will punish them, both in terms of votes and in terms of money. Uh, there's probably some truth to this. But most of my Jewish friends, and I expect there's some people, you know, in the college and even on this on this uh, call tonight, uh, I'd like to hear what they have to say. But my but what I'm hearing from my Jewish friends and we're hearing publicly is that uh, that most Jews are very, very open and want to be balanced on this. They do not want to see the uh, Palestinians subjected to oppression and they certainly don't want to see them bombed into uh, uh you know uh into uh, the caveman days which is what's happening now and uh and yes there would there be some money lost by candidates maybe would the votes go against them here and there maybe but our leaders are just all too concerned about the next election and too little concerned about what the long-term uh, what the long-term results of, of the policies that they make uh, are going to be. And, and Biden Biden really irritated me. When the first thing he did on the days after uh, October 7th was, was going to this Israel, Israel, Israel. Uh, it didn't say much, too much bad about the Palestinians. They didn't say anything at all, okay, as if they were a non-entity in this whole thing. And uh, now he and his people, including Blinken, have now been turning around and they have been trying to get uh, the Israelis to to uh, back off a little bit. Um, I don't know how much success they've had. I think maybe that the bombing has stopped a little bit, but I don't know if there's much left to bomb. You know, so that may be the, the, the problem there. Uh, and thirdly, the third point is the Palestinians have to back off a little bit. The Palestinians, uh, you know, they've been patient for at least 70 years and, and or they haven't been patient. Actually, there have been many, many cases of the two infants and defadas and other various situations where they haven't been patient. But they should be uh, pressured to be patient a little longer until these other two things can be handled. Uh, and and until the United Israel and the United States and Israel, if the United States really took a strong stand, the Israelis might resist for a while, but they couldn't resist for too long. Uh, and then the Palestinians would finally get something that's that's uh, that's reasonably fair. Uh, it, I will admit that initially my view was that uh uh you know the, the the colonialism which started in the 16th century and the great nations of europe went all over the world and divided it up amongst themselves you know you get these nice colored maps who's got what uh that started in the 16th century and finally more or less ended in most cases in the middle of the 20th century and most countries got their independence back and uh, so the so the colonization process was over, uh, with one uh, exception. Now we have Israel. We have a bunch, primarily a bunch of Europeans, going into Asia and taking over an area that they want for whatever reason they want it. And uh, uh, so my attitude is, well, you know, the Palestinians are right. They they that's their land has been you know for a couple thousand years probably or hundreds of years anyway and that they really did have a right to it but you know in thinking about it further we have to realize that borders do change uh this is something that's been going on for for hundreds of years of course and recently it's been going on borders change different uh, uh sovereignties different groups take over areas and and these changes take place and sometimes they're justifiable because the world population is growing and those that have resources such as land may have to share those resources in that land with other groups. 
because, as I say, because of the need for these resources by many groups. Uh, however, in, in, in the case where a group of people go in and take over land that has traditionally for a long time and belonged to someone else, there needs certainly to be just compensation and, and integration where appropriate in, in a fair and equitable manner. And, and we have not seen, we've seen attempts at that, but we have not seen success at that uh, in the Israel, in the Israel Palestine situation. Uh, now, as far as Oslo, a lot of people view Oslo as the as the what would have solved the problem. Now, that was Itzhak Rabin that came up with that, or he didn't come up with it necessarily, but it was under him that Oslo was signed. And not too long after that, he was assassinated because there were some some hardcore people in Israel that did not want a uh, peaceful solution. They did not want a two-state solution. They did not want to give up land for peace or any of this thing. So Itzhak Rabin was assassinated. Shimon Peres uh, took over, who was a bit of a hardliner. He softened up over time. Ehud Barak was not too bad, but he didn't last that long either. And then shortly thereafter, not too long thereafter, we got Netanyahu. And boy, oh boy, you know, he's... Uh, like I say, the best comparison I can come up with here is Andrew Jackson, uh, but just the bad side. Um, now, the consensus currently is that the Hamas actions of October 7th was an atrocity and that therefore they're the ones who really kind of started this current situation. Uh, I disagree with that. Uh, I think this started a long time ago. Uh, the Palestinians have been oppressed and subjugated and, and exposed to all kinds of tr treatments and indignities, uh, living in an open, the world's largest open air prison for the longest time. And sometimes when oppressed groups and individuals have tried and been patient to resolve issues in an orderly and socially acceptable manner, whatever that might happen to me, but they conclude it's not going to happen, been 70 years, uh, then they decide that perhaps some sort form of physical action must be taken. And that could be violence or violence of a terror, with, with a military nature. And of course, if they're on the other side, we call them terrorists. Okay. Uh, and they go ahead and do this and they use the methods that are available to them. They, 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 they don't necessarily follow the rules of war because they can't. Okay, they do not have the resources to do that. Now, um, the the in this case, I think the Palestinians don't. The Israelis is probably uh, the Israelis probably do. And as far as far as the oppression, uh, I guess we can take uh, you know a lot of a lot of what the the uh, Palestinians have put through have been put through. We would not put up with. And in fact, we're fortunate to to go back a ways. That our for, our founding fathers did not put up with it. They used, they armed themselves and used armed methods to eventually throw off the oppressors, and that was the beginning of our nation. And more recently, our 16th and possibly greatest president led the fight on behalf of others who were repressed from above, and and that of course uh, led to the end of slavery. Um, we should uh, uh, aspire to these legacies, at least uh, in a minimal way. Uh, again, most of all, I would like to see more discussion of this topic by our, by our esteemed and sophisticated people here at the College of Complexes. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Uh, all right. We're seeing as how uh, it's already 6.51. What we're going to do tonight is go straight into rebuttals. If you guys, oh, what are you talking about? Hey, wait, I got a bunch of questions here. Okay, yeah, well, not a bunch. bunch. I got a couple. Get up the All right. Format. All right, then I'll go to question. question. All right, go ahead, Ernie. Yeah, I have a question. I have a question for Mike. A couple of questions related to to uh, uh, electric vehicles. First of all. We talk about electric vehicles as if it were free, as if the free full were free. You just go plug it in and, and you charge up and it's free. Well, it's not free. 
Uh, has anybody come out with a study as to the cost per mile of running a car on electricity as opposed to gasoline? That's question number one. And question number two, if we feel that, that uh, electric cars are going to be less polluting, what about the notion that the, that the places that, that uh, uh, create this electricity are polluting? Of course, if they're coal plants, we that's that's clear what that is. Or if they're natural gas, they're polluting like heck. And yeah. and of course, if they're so if they're solar, no. And if they're nuclear, they're polluting in a different way. What do you yes. what do you have to say about those two things? Go ahead. Yeah, Hang Hold on, on Ernie. On. We're getting there. Getting... Can't hear. Can if somebody's talking, I can't hear them. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Bring the mic closer to you. Can you hear me now? Okay. Let me ask. So the first, uh, the second question was about pollution uh, uh, of the uh, sources for electricity for electric vehicles. And the first question was uh, cost cost per mile of electric uh, running an electric you know, car as opposed to of, gasoline. My rule of thumb with transportation, and that might not be correct, but it's close enough, is that the laws of thermodynamics, which means turning heat into energy, into transportation, my theory is that it's pretty close in costs any mode, airplane, car, electric, diesel, gasoline. It's kind of... It's kind of about the same costs, the like same type of uh, uh, energy use, and um, uh, what what's the term term for pollution? Uh, uh, the same. Can you get a little closer to the mic? Mike? So anyway, yeah. the laws of thermodynamics I go Look. by. It, it seems like all these transportation modes use similar types of energy, jet Let's fuel. Gasoline, diesel, electricity, yeah. it's all in the same ballpark, the amount of energy and uh, resources. The, 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 the pollution that is done to make the batteries is overwhelming. The electricity has to be generated by coal or gas or nuclear. There's no benefit to electric in terms of pollution whatsoever. It's total propaganda, 100%. No one wants to buy electric. They're accumulating on the lots of dealers are going crazy because they won't sell. They, they this is this well, constipating, it's constipating kind of the automobile industry. It's I, kind I, of I, I product. And you know, you know, but you know, well, you know electric, electric cars are a catastrophe. Now the hybrid is not a bad thing. Or if you had electric for a second car. But you got to sit for hours to recharge a goddamn battery. What do you do? Are you going on a trip? Or... Of the people are going to just plug it in in their garage overnight, just like uh, a cell phone. Do you have a cell you can't phone? Can't go on a trip in California. They want to go all electric, and they're having to have blackouts. They're having to have blackouts, and they're telling That's you peak like times not to plug oh, in your right. garage. Let me answer that. Question. Electric. So it's, it's for it's for retired uh, people who can sit at home at night. And plug it in during the night, and then they go out to the store and get some bread and butter, and yeah. come back home and plug it back in. Of your trip are less than <laughs> five miles, ten miles. Get a golf cart for God's sake. Exactly. There's a theory <laughs> out there that we should have golf carts. Mobility. If you want to give up mobility and go to a 15 minute even, city, you can. How many times? Can I walk one mile 50 in 15 miles? minutes. Oh, anyway, so a 15 Ernie, minute time city out, is. Time out. Time out. One pool at a time. Ernie, so I would think that, you know, if we do go into more renewables, I mean, years from now, they're going to be getting energy out of the middle of the earth, wind, solar, uh, you know, all kinds of ocean. Uh, where there's going to be a lot of electricity sources that are sustainable, and that'll be a better thing than burning oil and oil and having oil wars and more oil you gotta burn all the oil to produce the electricity <laughs> what, I'm, if, I'm what the up? you think it comes out of a bottle for god's sake where do you think uh, the and how are you gonna... comes from 
Well, is so how you going to make the car? Right, gentlemen. you in favor of electric vehicles. That's moronism in the extreme. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> it's a personal attack. Oh, <laughs> that's <laughs> Just well, like, well, okay. So the cost, the cost. Has there been? Have you seen a study, Tim, which shows the cost per mile? In other words, you can get a an estimate a from a dealer on the miles per gallon. Okay, maybe that, maybe those figures aren't realistic. But what kind of Why? figures are published as to how many miles you get on a charge I and how I'm, much that charge costs? Are there any study? Yeah. It probably varies by model. It's a, by it's a good question. It's a good question. I like it. Yeah, but yeah. some of this, data, yeah, okay. I had a hard enough time getting uh, data for this presentation. Some of but this elect stuff, electric's a catastrophe to go all electric. Yeah. How do you know? Are you in that question? Uh, I have insanity. Uh, Let's move yeah. on to the next question, please. Charlie, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, uh, let me get my picture up here. There we go. I'd like to ask Jim Fetzer here. Number one, I represented federal employees in misconduct issues for about four decades. There is no employee that I'm aware of who is discharged for a first and single offense of AWOL, particularly regarding a hospitalization situation in which there's complications. And number two, this is more of a fact than a question. You cannot embellish a penalty this applies in all labor law, not just the federal employees. All they, because you can't, there's one, one level of expectations. You can't say, well, they have higher responsibilities. Therefore, they get, they have a different standards of conduct. There is one standard of conduct applied evenly to all occupations. So your assertion there that he's Secretary of Defense. And therefore, he should give me given thrown the book at him is totally against labor law. Sure. He's treated like a lot of guys dead employee. for Christ's sake. This yeah, is a labor law. Crazy. This is this is Biden just lying and making up a story because the guy's dead, and they're too embarrassed to admit it because of the circumstance of his death. This hasn't got anything to do with labor law. Where you came up with that is beyond me, Charlie. Nothing to do with labor you kept law. Saying you kept saying he, he's the Secretary of Defense and he, he's responsible for the security of the world. You said that several times. I didn't say that. He's in the security of the world, the United States, for God's sake. And he's got security for himself personally 24 7, Charlie. It's impossible. It's, a, it's impossible no. as a practical matter that he was out of communication. It's just ridiculous. No. Oh, big deal. Now, another thing is, is I've been, I don't know who's talking. Please be quiet. I've been to multiple agencies in performance of my duties. And you kept saying the assistant director. Now, the assistant director's office is always, always adjacent to the director's office. You made an assertion there that the, the, the Kathleen didn't, had no idea of the situation, that's an absurdity of face value. The absurdity you know, is they didn't know where he was. They knew he was knew where he was. He got, he got to office. Ukraine, Charlie. He was in Kiev when he was taken out. He's in a whole bunch of little pieces in the rubble in Kiev. That's where you can find him. <laughs> okay, enough of the conspiracies. I mean, that's well, the he this is a conspiracy. Fact. This is a fact. This is where he is. He's he, well, he was the, for, uh, the cover Next question. Yeah, that's right. The whole what's fascinating is how they're trying to cover up. Remember what Nixon said: it's not what you did that gets you; it's the cover up. This cover up is absurd on its face. Okay. Next. That's question. why I'm saying this is what even a third year old, a third grader, could figure this out, Charlie. Okay, gentlemen, who's got the next question? Uh, yes, I'd like a question, please. Uh, my right, question is uh, to Dr. Fetzer. Um, just how many times do you have to get the shit uh, kicked out of you before you cry uncle? You walk through uh, various conspiracy theories at the start of your talk. One was the fact that Trump actually won the 2020 election. Uh, as somebody, as yourself, who was no stranger 
having the shit kicked out of them in court. Now, uh, I, from what I understand, you are a doctor of philosophy. Unfortunately, I don't have le any letters after my name. I'm just a humble part, uh, carpenter from the provinces. But um, I, from what I understand the philosophy, uh, one of the uh, methods of ascertaining the truth is called a dialectic, where you have a uh, somebody presents evidence and somebody has a rebuttal. And this is put forward in a court of law. This is what this is generally what we regarded as a good way of ascertaining the truth uh, in Western society. Now, from what I understand, uh, Trump had 61 court cases thrown out of court or lost in his in his attempts to uh, reclaim the, the, the election. Now, it wasn't for actually want of funds. He had quarter of a billion dollars donated by smocks like you towards towards his campaign. So he wasn't short of lawyer, lawyer fees. Um, and we all had, had all kinds of conspiracy theories on how the election was stolen. Uh, there was Italian satellites that uh, interfered with the, the Dominion voting machines. There was uh, there was Australian satellites that interfered with the, uh, the Dominion voting machines, um, all of which were aired on uh, Fog News, uh, which which we then went ahead and lost a defamation uh, case for the tune of $870 million. Now, let's bear in mind, this isn't just some uh, random guy like yourself foaming at the mouth and spouting bollocks on, 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 on the airways. This is a news-gathering organisation, one of the largest in the world. You think if there was any truth in this matter, they might have actually found some evidence. Oh. Now, you can say, oh, well, it wasn't Dominion. Oh, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was false voting. Well, okay, how about the recounts? The, 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 the recounts, the, 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 how about, all right, okay, well, then the recounts, what about, what about Trump's own people? How about people like, 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 the, like the head of cyber security for the Homeland Security, who declared it was the most secure election in history? How, how about, how, how about, how about, uh, how about his own uh, department of head of department of justice? You know, how about, how about uh, uh, you know, yeah, you know, you what's it, Bill, whatever his name is, who was his attack dog for years? I... Who attacked? Who, who, who set up? Who set up IRS uh, audits against his political enemies? This guy turns around and says it was there was no fraud. His own daughter says no, there was no fraud. This is, only, who did he believe? Oh, yeah. Oh, well, oh, do you know what? You believe people. This is, what's his name? Uh, uh, Judy, uh, Giuliani with his hair. Uh, uh, they believe that there was Sidney Powell, who, oh, by the way, who both been indicted in Georgia, right? So yeah. when, when, you, when you preface what's your latest conspiracy theory, following you, the mouth, and you, with you, uh, another conspiracy theory, which you've had the shit kicked out of you several times. You've act, that's actually been debunked. More time, lazy marine in boot camp. Okay, Kelvin, let's let him let him answer your question now. Go ahead, I Chick won't you try, Uncle. You you have uh, no grasp of the weaponization of the Department of Justice and the court system under this administration. None whatsoever. Oh, there was sixty one indictments. None of them have a basis in fact or in law against Trump. In all the cases involving Sandy Hook, none of them were decided on their merit. None of them went to a jury. Oh, including the one they you lost. Were, up and let me answer. They went the one to, they were decided. Including the one you lost. They were, including the one where you. Where you got the parents. So we $450 million. This is my question to you. Was your co-author settled out of court? How much did you settle for? You're I'm arguing about violate the female. rules. How much are you trying to argue? How much are you trying to argue? You're going to pay Kelvin. rather rather well, you, you, lost, you lost on the merits. All right, Kelvin, let I'm him sorry. answer. Do they, do they put answer. up with this kind of nonsense from you, session after session? You're you're one of the babbling idiots. I'm really insulted by you. Unbelievable. You know what's more I was explaining to you. How dare, how dare you my say you're insulted? When and you are dissed the parents American. of people who lost, you decide uh, what the hell you want to do. Children in a, in Charlie, this guy, this guy is unacceptable. He's off the wall. He, he's, uh, 
He's a loon. He won't. I'm not getting insulted. I lived with this. I'm an expert on it. And he's babbling. Yeah, you're an expert. You lost. That has no foundation. You're an expert. You're an expert. Okay. Okay. Everything he has okay. said you're, is you're, No, you're a in the mouth conspiracy theorist that I'm doesn't gonna, deserve the time of day. All right, Kelvin, let him answer. Jim, you got oh, any more questions? Next question. All right, next I have question. A question for Ernie. All right, Mike, go ahead and give a question yeah. to Ernie. Where's Ernie? I think listen, he also, Ernie we can Ernie. listen. I'm just going to make a closing remark and in, in oh, part. Talk this up. Ernie, I have a question for you. Go ahead, Jim, make your remark. No. Mike, we'll get we you been next. We've been talking all night. Mike, we'll get you next. Go ahead, Jim. Okay, well, I want to. I want to give everyone else here who's you know maybe more compatible with this guy, Kelvin. But look, none of these, uh, none of the lawsuits involving Sandy Hook were decided on the merits. They were all decided on procedural grounds, on presupposition. In the case of Alex Jones, a failure of discovery, and mine. There's a weird situation in Wisconsin where the judge can just set aside the evidence if he doesn't think it's reasonable. And he, he apparently believed the official narrative. And I uh, had a massive evidence, a FEMA manual, uh, uh, the FBI consolidated crime report, photographs of all the drill taking place as it took place. And he just said, I had two forensic document experts who said I was right in declaring the death certificate in question was a fake. I had two of them, and he just ignored them. So Kelvin may think he's all knowing, but in fact, I'm sorry to say he's massively ignorant, and I find it rather insulting to have to sit here and go on. Uh, 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 this is the same evidence that denies but a Holocaust. He has Holocaust no idea. No idea. Is what this he's the, it's the same evidence you have that denies a Holocaust, Dr. Petzer. Anyone who's done research on the Holocaust is either a Holocaust denier or a my case. liar. I rest my case. All right, yeah, well, it, it displays your ignorance and incompetence of research if you think you know what you're talking about. Yeah. Go to my blog right now, Ron Unz, U-N-Z, of Unz.com, published a huge piece about the whole account. I, I don't look at it a lot. Now, Kelvin, yeah, you're a moron. I'm sorry to say or yeah, not yeah, yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. Or, no, or, no, or, no, people or mentally that. bewildered. I know I'm you, violating. You represent yeah. the worst. You're a special worst, case of deserving. American politics. You're deserving. My God, unbelievable. All Listen, right. I, Unless anyone has an actual question for me, I'm going to, I'm going to, I've got so many other things I got to do. I got a whole other show tonight. Okay. I, I like the idea of the college, and I'll be back on February 10th, and we'll talk about Sandy Hook. Thank you so much. All right, guys Jim, are... stick around if you'd like. But the uh, next question, Mike, you've got a question for Ernie, Ernie? i got a question for you in the comments. Okay, can you hear me now? Ernie? Ernie, you're muted. But, uh, you're yeah. Ernie muted. No, Ernie. Ernie, can you hear me now? You're still muted, Ernie. Turn your mic on, Ernie. Turn your mic on. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Ernie. Okay, Ernie, I got a comment, and then I got a question for you. Um, okay, so I, I'm a person that understands that Israel is a certain group of people, and Jews are a certain group of people, and a lot of times they don't cause pets. Okay, and my... Well, I did some short research, which Charlie goes, oh, you're anti-Semitic. And I'm like, no, I'm anti-war. And, and my point, my, so what I wanted to say, Ernie, is what I saw. Hello? What, Ernie? Yeah. What I saw when I was doing some little bit of, little bit of looking around is that yeah. it seems the, whole, the whole problem with Israel in my estimation, I'm an economist and a finance person, is that when they divided up uh, Israel in 1948, it was very, very contentious. And the Palestinians did not, it seems like um, Israel or Jews or whatever, we got a, the most, the biggest part of the land in in uh, Israel, and the Palestinians were relegated to a much smaller part, and they were there before they. That's right. 
important. So I think that's the whole start of the problem. Yeah, that that's that. Yeah, that yeah. There was a war, and that was, the, and it was you know, the UN screwed it up, or that, that's the whole start of it. It was just divided up poorly, right at the beginning. And now it's lasted for 70 years. Both sides are terrorists. Both si sides are, you know, warmongers, whatever. So my question, you, so that's my comment, is that I, dividing up that land in 1948 was just very unfair. And the UN couldn't agree on it. And all countries didn't abstain from voting because they didn't like it. Okay, so my question to you is, since we give Israel $5 billion a year, they get the most military aid of any country in the world by America. Why aren't we telling them what to do with our bombs and our money and our bullets instead of asking them? Okay, I basically, you, you're right. Do you, want to, do you want me to answer now or do you want to finish the question? Well, and plus I, I think they should be paying for all this destruction. It's hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars. I know. I, I, I understand. I taxes going to, to clean up their mess. Well, so if I question, had... Why aren't we telling Israel? I mean, Israel's the size of Indiana. Yeah. <laughs> the economy of Indiana. I mean, it's a, you know, I don't want to say it's a shit old country, but it's not that, not that special. Well, actually... Actually, I, I, I meant to touch on this and, and didn't because of the limited time. Uh, what I wanted to also say is is we really need to divide, get away from this uh, joined at the hip relationship that we have with Israel. Uh, I First of all, a lot of people say, well, they're a very, very important ally because of where they are. Well, I, I don't quite... I don't quite agree with that. But let me let me say that we should have cut off aid to Israel years ago. Uh, because Israel now uh, is like uh, in Europe. Okay, let me let me see if I remember these numbers uh, per capita GDP. United States is number one with around seventy two thousand. The next country down is somewhere around fifty million, I think, and maybe that's Great Britain. I'm not sure, but very shortly below, in the top three or four, along with European countries, okay, is Israel. Their GDP per capita GDP is like 43, uh, 43,000 uh, per person. It's right up there with all the European nations except for one. They don't need our help uh, in terms of financial. In terms of military, they may need a little technology. Yeah, and, and if they do, then yes, we do have a right to have something to say. Not everything. We can't tell them everything oh, to do. But, but you, I agree with you. We should be. We should not be giving the aid to Israel that we are. What? What did okay. you say at the end there? I'm sorry. I can't. I can't hear you. What did you say at the end? I said we should. Uh, we should not be giving the aid to Israel that we are now giving to them. Either right. certainly, no, certainly no uh, uh, economic aid. They don't need the economic aid. Uh, well, military. We should be handling. We should be right. handling all security in that area. America. Yeah. Well, I may. Uh, uh, as, I'm sorry. What? We are what already. Yeah. They, they would. As far as the the military aid, there may be some technologies, although they they have they're pretty strong technologically themselves. But well, uh, they're responsible with the use of our our war weapons. I, mean, I know. I don't want my tax dollars going to killing kids. I don't want my tax dollars going to killing women. I agree. How are you responsible? It's a shame. What's that? It's a, it's a shame that our tax dollars are going to killing kids. I, I I I I basically agree with that. I I think that it's and that's that's what these it's movements hard. that are that are out there basically uh, they're saying cease fire, but they're also saying. No more dollars. They've been saying this since the beginning. No more dollars uh, to Israel for 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 killing. Okay, for military yeah. stuff. Yeah, of course. and and I no tend fight. to agree with that. Uh, but that that could be applied to a lot of countries that are getting military aid from us. You know, a lot of the a lot of stuff. Oh, that no yeah, that's none of they it. Get is, the by far. What's that? Yeah. They I get the most military aid of by far. 
are and they're irresponsible. Yeah. So enough's enough. Take All care. right. Who else? Anybody else have a question? Charlie, go ahead. Charlie, go ahead. Charlie's left the building. Charlie, are you there? He's probably in the bathroom. Give him, give him, uh, give him a couple minutes. Who else was our speaker? Bernie. Well, most of them have left because you guys have gotten into uh, into some. some <laughs> most of them is Dick. Is Dan still? Dan. Is he Dan. still there? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Dan, Dan's still there. Okay, well, three of us have held out at least. Dan, let's <laughs> ask Dan something. Dan, why are you going so friggin' far away from a market, man? There's markets uh, up by Loyola. <laughs> <one. laughs> yeah, <laughs> but they 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 charge five six bucks a pound for tomatoes. You know what? The South I I've switched from tomatoes. I'm substituting pickles and cucumbers. They're healthier. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. I don't know about pickles. What? I don't know about pickles, but you know cucumbers pickles? are pretty good. <laughs> All right. Uh, Charlie, you're back. Charlie, are you there? Go ahead. You got the... I don't get it. Charlie, go ahead. You got a tip. You got a tip in there, right? Yeah. Charlie, you're muted. You're muted, Charlie. Turn on your mic, Charlie. I've never been so much yelling in my life. <laughs> Turn on your mic. Oh, stop. Yeah, we can hear you now. All right, Ernie, you there? I am. Uh, the Baltic nations were occupied under force Yep, for 50 years. They're yep. called the captive nations of Europe. Yep. As far as I know, the United States didn't do anything. I think Alex, you know, where were you? Where were you? Did you call for any panels during I'm... that 50-year period? At all? Did you ever once call for a panel now you expect there to be a pox american i guess but you seem to be rather selective about this what makes the people in that part the middle east seemingly more important when it comes to human rights violations than the people of the baltics where were you where was i when when the baltics were occupied well, I okay. I agree with you. That's a problem. I think that that was the Cold War. Um, you know, they were part of the Eastern Bloc, not voluntarily, and there is not a lot we could do for the people uh, in Eastern Europe except what we finally did. We helped them. We helped to break the back of the Soviet Union, and thereby free them. And and uh, you know, the United it, States never recognized. Lithuanian independence when they declared it. I'm, when did they declare independence? 1991. Okay. We did not recognize that? I'd like to know when you called for a panel at all on the captive nations of Europe. I'm, I I didn't quite hear. What I, you said, what about the captive Why nations? did you ask for a panel or intercession for the captive nations of Europe. Jesus. You mean the ones that are still captive of the ones that were captive back then? I'm so concerned about this these Middle East, but where were you? I was I would think I was wherever it was. We were hoping that the Cold War would, would end uh well, so which sort anything. of did. You never said anything. It didn't concern you. I uh, I I think I probably said things back then. I don't remember specifically saying anything about uh, the Baltic states. Uh, certainly, certainly, most Americans in those days, uh, you know, wanted to uh, uh, reduce the power of of Russia, 
and the Soviet Union at that time. And, and eventually that fortunately happened. I don't know. I think we're possibly going into another Cold War here. And I hope this one comes out better. And and uh, I mean, there are a lot of people. There are a lot of people. I I I just cannot understand why people in Congress they're not even willing. We've got a country over there, uh, Ukraine, that's willing to bleed to help us keep Russia under control, and we don't even want to send them send them some weapons. Uh, I don't understand that. That that I think is wrong, and I'm I'm making a, uh, I talk about that all the time. Now back back in the day, uh, basically we were just trying to hold out against until until the Soviet Union. Uh, we thought the Soviet Union. Well, we didn't. We thought the Soviet Union would would eventually collapse, but we didn't know. So you did nothing. You did nothing. Who did nothing? The United States and you. All right. Well, Charlie, let's, we're gonna, have, well, well, what did you do, it Charlie? Wasn't on your list. What did you do? It wasn't, on your list of important, it wasn't important, right? What? what now, all of a sudden, the Charlie, Middle East is the number one thing. We've got to ever? do talk about it every month, you did, but you never talked about Lithuania. Well, Lithuania, I don't think, uh, is in quite the same danger that. that uh, Palestine and Israel are, and Ukraine. Uh, basically, my one of the th reasons that we ought to uh, be much more aggressive in Ukraine is so that we don't have to go to war for Lithuania. And and if 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 uh, Ukraine goes, it's quite possible that we'll have to go to war for Lithuania and a whole bunch of other countries. I think so. I That's my guess. I don't think okay, guys, what we're going to do now. I got one more question for Dan. Go ahead. Go ahead, uh, Dan. Dan. Yeah. Why are you and your girlfriend wearing coats indoors? <laughs> we're just, we turned down the heat a little bit. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Save money. I got a question for Dan. <laughs> yes. Uh, in my understanding, if you get sick, I was there the other day in the drugstore and they make prescriptions. And the scientific community has spent a lot of time developing medicines to cure illnesses. Yeah. And you seem to think that just eating a particular kind of food is medicine. I don't yeah. understand. It's a very complex all sorts of uh, complications get involved in the production of drugs. They control their dispense, their production, and so forth. And you come along with, I think, isn't this a bit of an oversimplification that you simply eat vegetables, fruits and vegetables, and, and this is going to be, you're going to live forever? Well, don't be antibiotics. And it's going to replace well, medicine. Be careful. It's the, as I said before, um, the found the uh, the what do you call it? Rockefeller Foundation is spending millions of dollars to, uh, as food as medicine. I mean, where does medicine come from? It comes from plants, basically. Aspirin is from a willow tree, I think. It yeah. was invented a long thousand years ago by the Greeks. Yeah. Um, yes, we're okay. I need an So you're equating so, eating a banana to a drug? Yeah, oh, it's a lot cheaper too. I mean, That's uh, pharma okay. is making a lot of money on sickness. So doctors are taught in school not to to help to help people, they're taught to treat sickness. <coughs> okay, gentlemen. And that's conventional talking. conventional wisdom. This alternative Everybody... medicine is nonsensical, and I don't think okay. it's even appropriate. As a matter of fact, I even say it's kind of dangerous. All right, Charlie, you we're going to think that you can come up with your own cure for illnesses through diet alone. Okay. 
We're going to go on okay, to a one-minute rebuttal now for anybody want it, but you got to go one minute or less. I'm going to do one minute or less. I'm going to do mine in one minute here, and I'm going to show a quick ass video that kind of sums up everything tonight that nobody's really talked about yet, and how I honestly feel. We're going to as soon as I get my share screen up here, I'll show you guys exactly where I'm coming from. Just give me a second, please. Most authoritarians all start the same way, boastfully, strutting like a rooster, posing for cameras, prancing before adored crowds, promises of prosperity and justice. Then, the persecution of faith and dissent, the propaganda, enemies' lists, informers. The secret police, the knock on the door. The stolen lands, homes, and dreams of generations. Yes, authoritarians always start the same thing. That's why more and more people are saying, Trump is just English for Castro. The Lincoln Project is responsible. Trump just wants to stay. Are we supposed to be able to see this at home? Oh, there. Okay. Yeah, you can see it at home if you want, but uh, we've seen I'm this simply, before. You have seen it before, Charlie, but yeah, you showed it twice already. I know, but that's honestly how I feel about Mr. So, Mr. so it's Trump. every every week. All right. Let's do it at the beginning and be done with it. All right. Give me Trump a minute. Trump wants to just stay out of jail. That's the only reason uh, he's running. That yeah. boy. Give me a minute here, please. I'm he knows to... if he's president again, he's not going to go to jail. And I'm sure my it's screen. The only reason, it's the only reason he's running, to stay out of jail. Okay, that's it for me. Anybody else real quick with a short Oh, I got read? one quick thing to say about car, uh, oil and cars. The answer is better transportation systems. Electric, buses, trains, EVs. I don't think electric cars are really the answer because they're too expensive in many ways. Anyway, so we need buses, trains, transit, bullet trains, electric trains, everywhere. Just superior transportation systems. Okay. Tell uh, electric, electric cars are cheaper to make, ultimately, because they have less parts. When they're built in quantity, they'll be a lot cheaper All right. All to right. make and maintain. Okay, Charlie, you want to rebut? Calvin, you got anything to say too? Uh, yes, I would. My my main protagonist is run off like the coward that he is. So I I I I just I just apologize if it got a little bit too heated. Okay, Calvin, enough said. Charlie, go ahead. All right. First of all, I'd like to thank our speakers, Ernie, Tom, uh, Jim, and Mike for their presentations and. Um, uh, uh, what's his name? Dan. They're very good. All right. Uh, number one, uh, you have to realize that the solution to climate change isn't necessarily going to be achieved through technology. It's called it's going to have to be a re it's going to have to be a reset of society in terms of its basic operations. So looking towards technology is is now the other thing I just heard is a fallacious error. Somebody just said electric cars are are maintenance free. No, it not really more, cheaper than regular cars. Couldn't be more wrong. Look up consumer reports, scheduled with an assessment of electric vehicles, and their major thing was electric cars need constant untold amount of maintenance to keep operational almost 200% more than conventional vehicles. So there's one correction there that I like that. And the last thing is, Mike, your basic premise is that all wars are for oil. Yeah. And you have these pictures of Israel and the Gaza. It's there is no oil, no oil whatsoever in Israel. On the pipelines. On, there is no oil. There is there is gas. 
natural gas in the Mediterranean no off of Gaza. Oil There's billions of, ga of, of whatever. There is no oil produced in Israel. There's, it there's ga it off of Gaza in the Mediterranean. It Natural gas, Charlie. From Russia. You're wrong. And You're wrong. Nothing. You can no, look at my maps. And your basic thing is you've got to research your topics. There are no okay. oil wells. Oh, in Bernie's Israel. there. All right, oh, Charlie. You you gotta, no. Okay, we're going to have to uh, conclude our conspiracy. A pipeline from where? Okay. It's pipelines and port, okay. ports. Check your maps. Get, get pipeline from where? From Israel to where? Where's the well? It's the Mediterranean. Where's the well? Oh, yeah. You didn't know your topic, Bell. <laughs> All right, Charlie. We're going to have to uh, do it. Kelvin, you got anything to say? No, I'm fine. Uh, just, uh, just a little thing on the electric cars. Uh, when gasoline cars first came on the market, you had to fill up your uh, gasoline from drugstores along the way. And they, and they weren't particularly efficient. And, they were, I, I, and most people say they will never take over the horses. So bear in mind that we are still in embryonic uh, technology when it comes to electrical electric vehicles and give, cut them a little bit of slack, perhaps. That might not be a bad idea because they've only been around for about 10 or 12 years and not really into production. Yeah, when you when you look at what gasoline, uh, t uh, uh, what the ice engine was uh, around about the time about 10, 10 12 years in, um, there weren't particularly great cars in those days. They're a novelty for the rich. Okay, anyway, yeah. enough, so guys. <laughs> we're going to have to uh, cut it off tonight unless Charlie wants to take the host controls. No. Um, all right, then, guys. We'll see you all People next should week. People should ride a bike, use their feet, plus the uh, Okay. All right, Ellen, I know you joined us kind of late, but it is uh, <laughs> 7.30 or so. I, we'll have yeah, I, I know the speaker didn't come, so then... We had we had a, a bunch of speakers as a free for all microphone. Oh, oh, oh. All right, let me con formally conclude the college tonight. Thank you all for attending, and I appreciate everything else. I'm going to log out now. Everybody have a good day.